Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are talking about the use of phosphodiesterase inhibitors to treat asthma. Okay, so um, we are currently discussing the pathology of asthma and we're currently discussing the late phase. So remember in the late phase what happens is that uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha causes type 2 activation of the endothelial cells, okay, of the blood vessels in the lamina propria. And this causes the recruitment of T-helper 2 cells from the bloodstream into the lamina propria. These T-helper 2 cells then release the two cytokines, interleukin-5 and granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, GMCSF, okay, also known as CSF2 for colony stimulating factor 2. Uh, both of these then cause the accumulation of eosinophils in the lamina propria and also then the activation of the eosinophils and the eosinophils then release the two cytotoxic proteins, major basic protein and also eosinophilic sorry, eosinophil cationic protein, uh, which then uh, kill the epithelial cells, and that leads to the damage of the epithelium. Okay, right. Uh, now, eosinophils also release other things. So, one of the things that they release are, they release cystinyl leukotrienes as well, just like the mast cells did originally. And the cystinyl leukotrienes, <coughs> excuse me, uh, will diffuse back, um, to the uh, bronchial smooth muscle cells and again will act on leukotriene receptors of both type 1 and type 2 on the surface of the bronchial smooth muscle cells and will cause um, the contraction of the bronchial smooth muscle. So you still maintain contraction of the bronchial smooth muscle in this late phase of the asthmatic attack. Now it's not as bad as in the early phase because you haven't got as much cystinyl leukotrienes being produced and you haven't got as much uh, histamine there as well, and histamine's a major uh, contractile force, basically. Okay, but you still do maintain some uh, contraction of the uh, bronchial smooth muscle cells, some over-contraction, and this leads to a, uh, uh, a prolonged bronchoconstriction, basically. But it's not as bad as in the immediate phase. The main thing that's happening is that you're damaging the epithelium. Okay, now the eosinophils are also going to release um, something which is going to drive the remodeling of the uh, bronchi, okay? So they're going to release something known as latent transforming growth factor beta, and this is often abbreviated to LAT for latent, TGF for transforming growth factor, and then it's beta, and it's specifically transforming growth factor beta 1. Okay, so let's turn over the page, and I'll write out this name in full, and then I'll tell you what's going to happen. Okay, so lat uh, transforming growth factor beta 1. Okay, so lat is short for latent. Okay, and this just means that the transforming growth factor beta 1 is not actually activated yet. It's going to have to be activated by something on the surface of the epithelial cells. So this latent transforming is the T of TGF, then G is growth, and the F is then factor, and then it's transforming growth factor beta 1. So there are many different transforming growth factor betas, okay? And uh, transforming growth factor beta 1 is the specific form of transforming growth factor beta that is secreted by these eosinophils, and it's in this latent form. Okay, so it's going to have to be activated by an integrin that is on the surface of the epithelial cells. So let me get the picture of the bronchus back again. Okay, so here's our picture of the bronchus. Okay, so uh, the eosinophils are in the lamina propria. They are secreting this latent transforming growth factor uh, beta 1. And this tra latent transforming growth factor beta 1 is going to be activated to transforming growth factor beta 1 by uh, protein complexes that are in the in the cell membrane of these epithelial cells. And these protein complexes are integrins. So, and let's have an epithelial cell here, okay? And here are the cilia, so I'm going to draw the epithelial cell out larger than I've ever drawn it before. Okay, so here is our bronchial epithelial cell. So this is a bronchial epithelial cell. Okay, now, uh, on the, in the membrane of this bronchial epithelial cell, you are going to have 
a certain integrin that is capable of activating uh, this um, latent transforming growth factor beta 1 into transforming growth factor beta 1. Okay, so the structure of an integrin. Integrins are a type of cell adhesion molecule, so they're involved in attaching cells to other cells and also in attaching cells to the extracellular matrix. Now, integrins all consist of two subunits. So here is an integrin. So the whole thing is an integrin, okay? And integrins consist of two separate subunits, what's known as the alpha subunit of the integrin, and then the beta subunit of the integrin, okay? So let's say this is the beta subunit, this is the alpha subunit. And they're both implanted into uh, the um, membrane, basically. So this will be called the alpha chain or the alpha subunit, and this will be called the beta chain, okay, or the beta subunit, okay? And uh, basically, there are a huge number of different alpha subunits and beta subunits, okay? Now, there are 18 different alpha subunits, okay? So, 18 possible alpha subunits. So, let me list the names of these off. So, the first 11 are nice and easy, okay? So, they are just called alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, all the way up to alpha 11. So, that's the first 11 alpha subunits, okay? Then it gets a little bit more complicated. Then you start using letters rather than uh, numbers for the next seven. So you have alpha D, alpha E, alpha L, uh, then alpha M, alpha V, okay? Uh, then you have alpha 2B and alpha X, okay? And those make up the final seven. Then for the beta subunits, you have eight beta subunits, okay? You have beta 1, through beta 8, so beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 8, uh, well, sorry, all the way up to beta 8. Okay, right, uh, so, in principle, the number of different integrins you could make would be 18 times 8, okay, whatever that is, so 10 times 8 is 80, 8 times 8 is 64, so 144 possible integrins, because there are uh, 18 possible alpha uh, su subunits that you can use, and for each one of those, there are eight possible beta subunits that you could pair that with, and therefore, overall, there are 144 possible integrins. However, not all of these 144 integrins are actually found in um, actual biology. Instead, there's around 24 integrins, so 24 of these 140 uh, four possible integrins that you can construct are actually used in nature. Okay, now, the integrin that's going to be very important for our story is the alpha V beta 6 integrin. So this is the alpha subunit you're going to use. So you're going to use the alpha V alpha subunit, and you're going to use beta 6 as the beta subunit. Okay, so this is a specific integrin, alpha V beta 6. Right, so, what's going to happen is that the latent transforming growth factor uh, beta 1 is going to come over to this alpha V beta 6 integrin, and it's going to be activated into transforming growth factor beta by uh, binding to the alpha V beta 6 integrin. Okay, so it will go into transforming growth factor beta 1. Okay, right, now what is this transforming growth factor beta 1 going to cause within uh, the um, bronchi bronchi, okay? Okay, so it's going to cause, firstly, uh, remodeling of the lamina propria. Okay, so it's going to activate myofibroblasts, okay, which is a type of cell that's involved in producing the connective tissue within the lamina propria. So remember, uh, I told you that the lamina propria, this layer here, the blue layer, consists of a lot of connective tissue, okay? Now, something had to make that connective tissue. Now, one of the cells that is involved in making that connective tissue are myofibroblasts, okay? So transforming growth factor beta 1 is going to activate myofibroblasts, and they're going to start chucking out more extracellular matrix, okay? So they're going to make more connective tissue. So ECM is short for extracellular matrix. Now, what's going to happen if you make more connective tissue within the lamina propria? Well, it's going to get 
permanently thicker. So you are going to start permanently thickening the uh, lamina propria, okay? And what's the result of that? Well, let's have a look at our picture. If you permanently thicken the lamina propria, you're going to get, um, you know, it's going to push the basement membrane inwards, and then it's going to push the epithelial cells inwards. So you're going to get permanent narrowing of the lumen of the bronchi, okay? So it's going to permanently narrow the bronchi. Okay, so that's one of the things that transforming growth factor beta 1 does. In addition, it goes back to the bronchial smooth muscle cells and causes uh, bronchial smooth muscle cell hyperplasia. Okay, so it's going to cause hyperplasia within the bronchial smooth muscle cells. Let me just explain uh, what hyperplasia means. So bronchial smooth muscle cell hyperplasia. So, basically, if you want to grow a tissue, okay, so let's say I have a little tissue here that consists of for simplicity, just four cells, okay? And I want to grow it. I want to make the tissue bigger. There are two ways that you can grow a tissue. One is through hyperplasia, okay? Now, hyperplasia is where the cells divide, and therefore you end up with more cells, and therefore a bigger tissue, okay? But the cells themselves do not get any bigger. So you end up with a bigger tissue because you've got more cells. Okay, so that's hyperplasic growth. Okay, the other type of growth is what's known as hypertrophy. Okay, and in this case you don't make more cells, instead you just make the cells bigger. So the cells themselves are going to grow in hypertrophic growth, and that's going to mean that the overall tissue becomes bigger. Okay, so what we are going to do is we're going to cause bronchial smooth muscle cell hyperplasia. So basically you're going to make the bronchial smooth muscle cell layer thicker and the way you're going to make it thicker is by uh, producing more bronchial smooth muscle cells not by making the individual bronchial smooth muscle cells themselves bigger okay so you're going to get a thicker layer of bronchial smooth muscle cells this also is going to lead to the permanent narrowing of the uh, bronchus uh, lumen because again just as when we made the lamina propria thicker we push the basement membrane inwards. If we're going to make the smooth muscle cell layer thicker, that's also going to cause the pushing inwards of the uh, basement membrane. But in addition, this means that the next time you have an asthmatic attack, your bronchial smooth muscle cell layer is thicker. It's capable of a more powerful contraction. It's going to be able to bronchoconstrict greater, basically. The bronchoconstrictile ability of the smooth muscle cell layer is going to get greater. So it means that gradually your asthmatic attacks are going to get more and more severe because next time um, your uh, airways will constrict more and the lumen will narrow even more. So the obstruction that the immediate phase of the asthmatic attack achieves is going to be worse, basically. So your asthmatic attack is going to get worse and worse and worse. So this uh, leads to the deterioration, basically, and why asthma gradually gets more severe. Okay, so that now summarizes the late phase. There's one more thing that we need to just talk about, which is the secondary immune response. Okay, so remember when we were talking about our first exposure to the allergen, um, we launched a primary adaptive humoral immune response against the allergen that ended up in producing IgE, and this was a, a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. So where is this? Here it is, okay, um, right, however, after a few weeks of not being exposed to the allergen, the humoral adaptive immune response will fade away, basically. The cells that are producing the IgE will be removed from the blood and the bone marrow, um, because they're plasma cells, so plasma cells like to be in the blood and also the bone marrow. Um, and IgE levels will gradually fall down once you're no longer creating any. Uh, it will be removed from the blood as well. And um, then all that you've got left then is the IgE that was mounted on these FC epsilon R1 receptors on the mast cells. Now this has a much longer half-life than IgE in the blood. It lasts for months and months and months. Uh, but if you didn't make any more IgE, eventually this would go. So you'd stop being allergic 
to uh, the allergen, basically. Now, we know that that isn't what happens, okay? So why doesn't that happen? Well, you must produce more IgE. So, when you are re-exposed to the allergen, what will happen is the allergen will now also set off the immune response all over again. So the allergen will now cause what's known as a secondary immune response. Okay, so the secondary time you're exposed to the allergen, you get a slightly different type of immune response. Okay, so this is the secondary immune response. And the production of IgE this time will be much, much quicker. And you'll also produce much, much more. So, basically in the primary exposure, what will happen, okay, if we, if we look at the primary immune response, let's say you're exposed to the allergen here, what will happen is the IgE will go up very gradually and it might get up to here. And then after a few weeks, of course, it'll drop back down like this. So if this is IgE level, basically, this is what the primary um, uh, adaptive immune response will look like, okay? Whereas the second time you're exposed to the allergen, let's now plot the um, exposure from here again for the secondary time you're exposed to it. What will happen is you'll get a rise in IgE much quicker. You'll produce a lot more, so it will go up a lot more rapidly, okay? And then it will come down again, okay, as it's removed from the blood. So the secondary immune response is much, much quicker to produce IgE. And this will happen every time uh, you are re-exposed to the allergen. You will uh, launch the adaptive immune response against it all over again. It's actually a slightly different process because you've got memory B cells and memory T cells. And it's not very well understood how the secondary adaptive immune response is different from the primary immune response and how you activate the memory B and T cells. Uh, but you do. Okay, and you'll produce the IgE all over again. So you produce a whole fresh load of IgE. So every time you're exposed to it, you are uh, effectively priming your body for an another asthma attack. You're keeping yourself refreshed, basically. So this will lead to the production of more IgE. IgE will go back up in the blood, and all of the free FC epsilon R1 receptors will now get IgE against the allergen reloaded again. And then, uh, if you get an as if you get re-exposed to the allergen again within a few months, then it will trigger an asthmatic attack again. So also each asthma. Each exposure to the allergen, as well as producing an asthmatic attack, is also uh, preparing you for the next asthmatic attack. Okay, so that now summarizes the pathology of asthma. In the next video, what we'll do is turn our attention to uh, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors and how they can be used to treat asthma.